I'm going to go, if we could, in the word this morning. We're going to go to Luke, the 19th chapter. Familiar text. As, as we look at the word this morning, I want to talk about some roots. John the Baptist said, When he came, he said, already the ax is laid to the root. If you don't deal with root issues, you'll be in a cycle of reliving the same things over and over again. And I found as believers, sometimes, I mean, we've got the victory. We name it, claim it, blab it, grab it, believe it, profess it. But sometimes there's some gaps where we go through a cycle of something, we feel like we're out of it, but then it reappears and we realize maybe we dealt with the fruit of something that happened in our life, but we haven't dealt with the root. You know, our vice president went down to South America to try and find the roots of illegal immigration. I have not heard of the roots yet. We go to the doctor and we want a cure, but sometimes they just treat the symptoms. And so we might get a little bit better for a season and a time, but we're always having to deal with the fruit that pops up in certain seasons. And so us, all of us today, I believe that there is a root to some of us walking in cycles of heartbreak and heartache and dysfunction. And and I'll, I'll just say this, we are believers, but we all go through stuff, right? And, and just because you have a financial problem, just because you have a physical problem, just because maybe someday you wake up and you don't feel very good or uh, you're a little bit, I want, I want to say this, uh, down in the mouth or depressed, that should be a moment in a person's life as a believer. It should not be a cycle. It should not be a reoccurring event that happens time and time again in us. So I want to talk about some root issues. And this is an unfamiliar scripture as far as maybe dealing with root issues. But if we could begin verse 11, Luke 19, let's stand to our feet for the reading of the word. This is a prophetic parable that Jesus is speaking as he's heading into Jerusalem. So he's He's laying up a foundation for something they're about to experience. In verse 11, it says, And as they heard these things, he proceeded to tell a parable because he was near Jerusalem. He's telling this parable to coin something that's about to happen. And because they supposed that the kingdom of God might appear Immediately, Think about that. The expectation was so great with the disciples when he was heading into Jerusalem, they thought that the kingdom of God, heavens would part and manifest right at that moment. And he said, therefore, a nobleman went into a far off country to receive for himself a kingdom and then return. Calling 10 of the servants, he gave them 10 minus and said to them, engage and do business till I come. But his citizens hated him. And sent a delegation after him, saying, We do not want this man to reign over us. And when he had returned, having received the kingdom, he ordered these servants, to whom he had given the money, to be called to him, that he might know what they had gained by doing business. The first came to him, saying, Lord, your mina has made me ten more. And he said to him, Well done, good and faithful servant. Because you have been faithful with a little... You shall have authority over 10 cities. So we're moving from something that is a little bit of money to all of a sudden having great authority over a region. And the second came and said, Lord, your mina has made me five minas. And he said to him, and you are to be over five cities. And then another came and said, Lord, here is your mina, which I have kept and laid in a handkerchief. For I was afraid of you because... I know that you're a severe man. You take what you did not deposit and reap what you did not sow. And he said to him, I will condemn you with, the wor- with your own words, you wicked servant. You knew that I was a severe man, taking that which I did not deposit and reaping where I did not sow. Why then did you not put the money into the bank that at my coming I might have collected 
it with interest. And he said to those who stood by, take the mina from him and give it to the, those who have ten minas. And they said to him, Lord, he has ten minas. I tell you, for every one who has, more will be given. But to him who has not, even that which he has will be taken away. And this is where it gets really heavy. It says, but as for the enemies of mine who did not want me to reign over them, bring them here and slaughter them before me. Wow. <laughs> Lord, add your blessing to the reading of your word this morning. And we just ask that this single solitary issue that we would cross over, we would be Hebrews, we'd cross over from one place of knowing you into another place of knowing you, that the ax would be laid to the root, and Lord God, a sense of awe and wonder and appreciation, Lord God, and submission would come upon us, Lord God. We thank you for being our Lord, in Jesus' name, amen. And so, many times when we talk about this specific scripture, what we're going to find is we teach about stewardship. How many of you know you got some talents? You got some gifts. Every single one of us, we, if we have anything, it's been given by a benevolent God on loan. And so God's given us all these things. And I'll just say, he expects us to do something with the things in our lives that he has given to us. But this parable, if you read it, it is not because he shifts gears. It's not about stewardship. It is about lordship. It's not about stewardship. It's about lordship. He said, he said, those who did not want me to rule over them, he said, you know, if you, if you don't get the Savior, you get the opposite. If you don't receive Christ, you get Antichrist, right? If you reject knowledge, you get stupidity. Can I have a witness in here this morning? And so God's given us all these things, but many people, I, listen, I want Jesus to be my Savior, but I also want him to be the Lord of my life. And many people, they want a savior, but they don't want a Lord. They want a healer, but they don't want a Lord. They want a protector, but they don't want a Lord. But lordship is the core key issue. It is history's hinge. At the end of this age, it is not going to be the day of healing. It is not going to just be the day of blessing or preaching or manifestations or miracles. It is called the day of the Lord for a reason. It's about his lordship. He from there goes into Jerusalem, and there's a couple guys, the couple guys with the donkey. He says, you're going to find a couple guys, and they've got a foal and a mother, and just go and take them. And when they try and stop you, say this. It doesn't even say that they knew Jesus. Didn't pull the Jesus card on them. He said, just tell them that the Lord has need of it. That meant something to those two guys. Because obviously, the people who had the donkeys had something inside of them that whatever the Lord needs, the lordship issue was already settled. They go into Jerusalem. People are saying, Hosanna, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. And listen, they were not rejecting Jesus as Savior or as miracle worker or as prophet. They were specifically rejecting his lordship. They were rejecting his lordship. And so all the things in our life are a byproduct of our, us positioning ourselves to have Jesus as Lord. And so many times people want the, the byproduct of the lordship of Jesus Christ, but we don't want the prime product, which is subjection and submission. God gave me free will. God he. he He's Lord, but he gave me free will. And with my free will, I choose to do what he wants me to do. God's not going to make me. But on a daily basis, we need to say this, Lord, what do you want for my life? It's not multi multiple choice gospels. It's like, how many know God's got a specific plan for your life? But without the lordship issue settled, you will never know what that is. You'll always be double-minded. You'll always, as you're pursuing what you want because you know what God wants to bless you, you won't step back and say, hey, you know what? Lord, whatever you want. What do you want for my life? You're the Lord. I'm not. My parents, 27 years ago, left a church they did not want to leave to go to a church that they necessarily didn't want to go to. 
My dad left the comfort of having his weekends off to the conflict of spending in the bike parties with people puking all over the place and going into penitentiaries with a lot of people he could not even relate with. But the Lord required it. The Lord said. And when you understand this, by subjecting yourself to the Lordship of Jesus Christ, that's when he actually begins to begin to direct your path and direct your steps and speak things to you because your mind is wide open. Lord, whatever you want. You want the donkey? Do you want the job? Do you want the church? Whatever you want. And the Lord says, that's what I'm looking for. He's not just looking for blind obedience. He's looking for a tender heart of affection and submission towards us that say, Lord, I submit to you. It's the submission word. See, the word Lord, it says authority and power. Lordship is a reflection of his authority and his power in our life. So, so if, I, if I'm powerless in an area of my life, I got to go back and reflect, okay, is the Lord, am I allowing the Lord to be the Lord of this area of my life? It's because when he's Lord of your life, how many know he can make dumb people smart? He can make ignorant people wise. He can make sick people well. He can re reconcile and recover relationships. He can make the dead rise, but it's through the byproduct of him being our Lord in our life. Jesus said this, all authority and power is given to me. And he said, I'll give it to whoever I want to. And so all authority, all power is connected to his lordship. Also, his lordship says this, he is the owner. He's the Lord because it's all his. Can we just say that? It's all his. My wife is his daughter. My kids are his heritage. Everything that I have, when I recognize his lordship, you know what? That breaks covetous off of me. Because how can I be stingy with something that isn't even mine to begin with? And if God got it to me, he can get it through me. The word Lord speaks of having honor and respect. If I'm dishonoring and disrespecting people, it might not be an attitude problem that I have. It might be a lordship issue that I have. He's the creator. He owns everything. I want to read out of Colossians real quick this morning. <laughs> Colossians says this in 1 and 15. It says, He is the image of the invisible God and the firstborn of all creation. For by Him were all things created in heaven and in earth, visible and invisible, whether they be thrones, dominions, rulers, or authorities. All things were created through Him and for Him. And He is before all things, and in Him do all things consist. And he is the head of the body, the church. He is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead, in that everything he might have preeminence. For in him all influence of God, for in him all the fullness of God was pleased to dwell. And through him to reconcile to himself all things, whether they be things on earth or things in heaven, making peace. By his own blood through the cross. It's all his. The lordship issue, it's, it's all his. When God painted on the canvas of creation, he didn't have to sign his name or get a patent. Do you understand that? Because it's all his. He didn't have to get royalties or rights when the birds sing a song. That's his song. Everything that we have is because of his. And at the end of the day, the world that we live in right now, the great battle is not transgender. It is not economy. It is about lordship. It's about lordship. You know, I love our country. And I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States. But I cannot pledge allegiance the day they take away the under God part. Because it is through 
God's authority and God's sovereignty and God's lordship that we have anything. The only way we have freedom today is because of the Lord. Because where the spirit of the Lord is, there is freedom. And the crazy thing about the scriptures that I read before this, all of these folks were servants in the parable. And he goes into Jerusalem where everybody were citizens. So let's just say this, they were servants of the king and they were citizens of the kingdom, but they still rejected his lordship. And he said, because you rejected my, he, he was not, he was not crucified just for being a healer. He was crucified for being a king with authority. He was crucified for being a Lord. And I got to back up and look at myself and I say, Lord, are you the Lord of every area of my life? Are there certain cycles and certain things that I go through where maybe uh, I haven't let you have the full reign or full authority that your blood bought price paid for in my life? I want to make you my Lord. I want to receive you as Lord. In fact, our salvation is a byproduct. We, we say this, and I, I'm not splitting hairs or anything, but we say this, you know what? Jesus saved me. But that's not what the scripture says. Only it says this. It does say whoever shall call upon the name of the Lord. Now, that is recognizing his position in our life. He's the founder, originator, owner of everything. He is the boss. And so that's why I make my request known to him. I bring my plans to him because he has the right to change those at any time. I got baptized because he's Lord. I didn't feel like it, but he was Lord. I give, not because I necessarily want to all the time, but because he's Lord. And the Lord says, hey, Dan, I want you to go over there and do that. You know, uh, I change occupations. You move to places. And sometimes it's by the, sometimes you're just trying to follow the Lord best you can. You don't get a thus saith the Lord. But how many know sometimes you do get a thus saith the Lord? Sometimes God does say something specific. And in our culture, our society right now, the battle, the epic battle of every generation has been for the lordship of Jesus Christ. The government's not my Lord, right? My friends can't save me. On my best day, we are so dependent upon his governing influence over our life. What happens was, is because Israel rejected his authority. Jesus said, you're not going to see me again until you say, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. That is you positioning yourself for my rule and my reign in your heart. And because of that, here's what they said. They said, we have no king but Caesar. They got Caesar. They got Titus. They got the papacy of Rome in the Inquisition. They got Stalin. They got Hitler. And someday, if you believe the eschatology of it, they're going to get Antichrist only because they rejected the lordship of Jesus Christ himself. I say, Lord, not just a name. It's not his name. It's a holy position. It's a title. It's a submission to the only God that loves me and cares for my soul. I have no problem submitting to the authority of God because I know he only wants what's best for me. The Bible says in Philippians, it says that though he was God and didn't think it robbery to be equal with God, made himself of no reputation, came in the form of a servant, humbled himself to death, even the death of the cross. It says, therefore, God has highly esteemed him because he submitted to the lordship of his father. God gave him a crown of authority. Remember this, lordship and authority go together. I have authority. Uh, I like to lay hands on people and see him saved and filled with the Holy Ghost and see him healed, but that is directly connected to his lordship because his lordship is directly connected to authority. That every knee would bow. That's coming a day. And every tongue will confess that he is Lord. He is Lord. Whether you believe it or not, he's still Lord. It doesn't change anything. You know, Nobody breaks the law. The law breaks you, right? It's like the law of gravity. There's a law of lift too. You're not going to break the law of gravity. 
unless you have a higher law, which is the law of life. It's the same way with God, because God is Lord. He sets the boundaries. He sets things in order. He enforces them with his will for our protection and also to reject the things that would be harmful to us. I have authority because I'm under authority. I have authority because I yield myself under his lordship. Part of the lordship here in Acts, the second chapter, it says this. When the apostle Paul or the, the apostle Peter had preached, they said, what must we do to be saved? He says, he says, don't you understand this? The message was this. Don't you know that this same Jesus that you crucified, God has made him both Lord and Christ. And it is the confession of his lordship in our life that brings the benefit and the byproduct of salvation. You could say, save me, Jesus. But if the lordship issue isn't solved in my life, I'm going to be saying, save me, Jesus, for the same thing again and again and again. But the lordship is like, okay, I'm not my own. We talk about ownership again. Because he's my lord, I am not my own. Because the lord owns everything. I'm bought with a price. And that gives me peace because that means that God has a form of control over my destiny as I yield my will to his lordship. With the lordship issue, the byproducts, gifts of the spirit. 1 Corinthians 12 and 3, it says, No one can call Jesus Christ Lord except by the Holy Ghost. Nobody can call Jesus Lord except by the Holy Ghost. Well, what does that mean? That means when God sends you, because he so desperately loves you, when he sends you the reality of who he is by the Holy Ghost, you have the ability to receive the revelation of his Lordship in your life. Many people have said, I've, I've tried that Christian thing. I tried that church thing. I've, I've gone to prison for years. And, and people have said, yeah, I've, I've been there and done that. I say, yeah, yeah. But did you make him? Lord of your life. That's like, it's not a marriage of convenience. It's not until I get blessed or I get out of this situation. It's like, here's my life. I'm bought with a price. I'm not my own anymore. I yield to your authority. I yield to your destiny. I yield to what you have as far as power and authority in my life. Another byproduct and benefit is peace. Romans 5.1. Through his lordship, we have peace. We have rest. Because of his lordship. Because he is the Lord of the Sabbath. When I consistently and continually on a daily basis try and yield my life to the lordship of Jesus Christ, I expect people are going to get saved. Yeah. Why? Because I prayed to the Lord of the harvest. And the Lord begins to summon with his authority and bring people into my life to be changed. Security is through of subjecting ourselves to his lordship. It says, because the name of the Lord is a strong tower and the righteous run into it and they're saved. Provision is a byproduct of his lordship because my God owns the cattle on a thousand hills and he doesn't have to brand them. They're his. He's got them. God can supply all of my needs according to his riches. If he's my Lord, he's responsible for me. If he's my Lord, he's responsible for my well-being. If he's my Lord, he's responsible to take the essence of who he is in his kingdom and release it through my life. Joy. Romans 5.11 says, as we consider the Lord, it says that he will rule our hearts and minds. Freedom, because we know where the spirit of the Lord is, there is liberty. Healing, the centurion, servant, he didn't necessarily understand Judaism, but he understood authority. He didn't understand Messiah, but he understood authority. And so he recognized the authority in Jesus' life, and he said, Lord, I know that you're a man of authority, you're under authority, and that if you would just ask, you don't even have to go to where my servant is and he'll be healed. And Jesus said, I've not seen such great faith in any man. It wasn't just faith in a healing, it was a recognition of his lordship. In his ability to do things that are beyond the natural. I see many people, I, you know, how many of you have all had, we've all had financial problems, we've all had physical problems. It's in those areas of my life that I say, okay, God, 
I know I'm saved, I know I'm born again, and I know I'm a benefactor of your goodness because of what Jesus did. But as I mature, am I allowing you to be Lord in the decisions that I'm making, in the relationships that I have? You know, I was talking to Trish, and for years, a lot of, now I will say this, yielding to the Lordship of Jesus Christ, it is, it is not a difficult thing to understand, but it is a hard thing to do sometimes because I like to be in control of my life. I like to, I like to have my hands and I like to figure things out for myself until I can't figure it out for myself and I can't control it. And I think to myself, wouldn't it just be so much better if I would have yielded to the Lordship of him before I had to run to him and say, oh God, here I am again. I didn't consider you. You know, uh, Trish and, and Chip and I, we uh, have talked and, you know, this is a deploying station. This is a sending station. People come in and out of here. People go and, and you know, that, that's the Lord. We're a living entity and, and we are part of the body of Christ, but we are not the body of Christ. And I'm, disclaimer, disclaimer, some people come here for a season. But sometimes, how I many you know church would be really easy if it wasn't for people? It just would, you know? And so we go to church, there's kind of a honeymoon stage, but then all of a sudden God begins to work things out in us because of the people he puts us in relationship with. And I've seen people get mad or get offended and, and go and run and, and Chip and I look at each other and say, we have one question for you before you leave. It's not who's right and wrong. I mean, usually there's two sides of it. It's are you called here? Did the Lord call you here or did the Lord not? And so for us, uh, I can honestly say, uh, we don't have a choice because out of our free will, we chose to do what God's called us to do, right? It's not like he's a puppet master. We yield our will and our desire to him and to his lordship, but then he can begin to direct our steps. That's a good thing with direction as well. If you acknowledge the lordship of God in your life, your ways will be established and he will direct your steps. But you've got to acknowledge the lordship part of it for the direction. I see a lot of people, they struggle and they're double-minded with a lot of things. I think a lot of the double-mindedness would stop if we just back up and say, okay, I want this. This person wants me to do this. But Lord, what do you want? Lord, really, what do you want in it? Because I'm not representing myself. I'm a servant and I'm a citizen of your kingdom. I'm representing you. And so if we were just to really meditate and ask the Lord, Lord, you have control of my life. I, I yield my choices, my desires to you. And you begin to watch God highlight and begin to direct in certain things in your life. And I'm going to tell you, sometimes it's scary because it doesn't make sense. Sometimes it's hard to hear the Lord because we have a certain direction, trajectory we want to go in. But when we begin to yield the reins of stubbornness to the Lord and say, Lord, direct our steps. The Bible says, whoever's mind is stayed on the Lordship of God, it said that he'll establish their thoughts. He'll establish peace in our life. I believe that in our generation and for all generations after this that the Lord tarries, the great epic battle is who is Lord. That's why communism and socialism hates Christianity. Communism and socialism hates Christianity because we cannot be manipulated by finances and food and intimidation, but we're led by the Spirit of God and the Spirit of our Lord Jesus Christ. They can't control us because we subject to an authority that is over their self-imposed authority. And that's the threat. The threat is that we will bow our knee to no other but the Lord. I want us to stand to our feet this morning. Joel, the second chapter, gives a pretty heavy account of the day of the Lord.
And it says that the nations tremble. Their faces gather blackness. It says it is a terrible time for the devil and those that serve him. It just is. Because the Lord is taking the kingdoms back one generation at a time. And like in the Revolutionary War, we can say this, we have no Lord but Jesus. We have no King but Jesus. I want to look inside this morning. I want us to look in a mirror and say, Lord, are there areas of my life where I've tried to reap the benefits of salvation without the submission to your Lordship? I've spoke with a lot of young people and they've said, I feel like the Lord's telling me to break up with this young man, but I'm going to evangelize him and lead him to the... <laughs> it might not even be that they're not Christian. It just might be the Lord says, no, he's got somebody better for you. But it's in those times, is he your Lord or is he not? When you frankly read something in the Bible and say, the Lord says, commune with one another, break bread with one another, get baptized, you know, give to one another, bear one another's burdens. And that's not a suggestion, that's a commandment. It's like, when the Lord said it, I want to do it. I want to be quick to do what the Lord says. So Lord, we just lift our lives up to you this morning. We thank you that we don't have to worry about provision because of how much money's in the bank or lack of. Because the Lord is my shepherd. And because of your Lordship, I will never want. Deuteronomy 8, 18. That is the Lord that gives you power to get wealth to establish his covenant. It's a blessing for a purpose. In the parable, Lord, it wasn't about stewardship only. It was about lordship. Father, I just ask that you would forgive me when I get stubborn. Forgive me when I kick against you. Forgive me when I'm disobedient, Lord. Forgive me when I'm not yielded to you the way that I need to be. Lord, I just want to be tender and surrender to you this morning. I found that life is more simple when I just say yes to your guidance, when I just say yes to your ways, when I just apply your wisdom and your authority over my life. Or, Lord God, we could be like those who say, I will not have this God, this malevolent, benevolent, I mean, being direct me instruct me tell me what to do I pray for a heart of submission in my life Lord that I wouldn't wrestle against you in these areas and I just want to ask this morning is there an area of our life where we would say that he's not the Lord of that area I'm not saying that you're not saved I'm saying you struggle with the release of his governess in your life. I want to pray for you. And if there's someone in here this morning and you say, I have never accepted the lordship of Jesus, therefore I know I'm not saved. That was the original sin. They wanted the fruit of what God had without the governess of the one who gave it. That was Adam, that was Lucifer. And I just say what Elijah said this morning. He said, he said, if Baal is God, if Baal is Lord, serve Baal. But if the Lord is the Lord, yield to him because you can't serve two masters. If you want to accept Jesus this morning, I want you to slip up your hand. I want to pray for you. Well, Lord, I thank you this morning. When we say, Lord, it's, it's not that it's only your name. It is your position 
of influence, authority, and power in our life, Lord. Father, give us the wisdom to yield to your authority every day, Lord. I want to say this, I, I, I just felt like the word authority, authority. If somebody's having a problem with their boss or you consistently have problems with your employer, every place you go, you're there for a little bit and God gave you that job and you keep headlong running into uh, bosses or foremen that you don't like, it might not be a foreman issue, it might be a lordship issue. The Lord might be trying to teach you something about himself through that natural relationship. Well, Lord, I bless my family this morning. I thank you for another day to honor you. I thank you for honor the King tonight. Lord, I pray whatever the message was this morning that each one of us, Lord, we would have the word of the Spirit into our own lives to carry out. Lord, I thank you that every miracle, every prayer, Lord God, every healing that was prayed for this morning is manifest for your great name and for your glory. I thank you our families are being saved. And Lord, I thank you that at the end of the day, you are gonna rule all nations with a rod of iron because that's just who you are. Father, we give you the praise in the mighty name of Jesus. Amen.